Well, I just want to say thank you so much for uh, having me to talk today. Um, I'm a little bit of a sheep in wolf's clothes here because I am a urologic oncologist, but this is something that I am very excited and very passionate about. So I'm just going to show you a ileal conduit here. We kind of talked about it and thought that that would be kind of the best thing to show. So we'll just go ahead um, and get started. So. Um, just a, a disclosure, but also a cheap promotion for myself. Uh, we are an intuitive case site for uh, urinary diversion, all, all intuitive cases. Um, so if anybody ever wants to come hang out with me, uh, just send me an email. And I also have done some stuff for Medtronic and Hugo. Um, so why robotics? So for bladder cancer specifically, I think the um, data is pretty clear, so I'm not going to um, perseverate on this, but I do want to point out that the NCCN uh, has added robotic cystectomy as a uh, very reasonable way to manage uh, bladder cancer patients, and I want to like highlight intercorporeal is now. Um, just to get to know the audience a little bit, how many people do intercorporeal urinary diversion? Oh. What a great crowd. <laughs> Love it. Um, so this is just a little bit about how I do it. Um, so port placement is key. Keep it very efficient, 10 to 15 minutes. Um, I think being able to, uh, you know, max out in T-Berg, bring patients back uh, for especially neobladders, if you have the um, bed that interacts with the uh, robot in pairs is usually the best. Key instruments, I usually use uh, two tip-ups for the urinary diversion. And then uh, Sureform or handheld stapler, like I think you can do it anyway. I don't think there's one way to do it. And so a lot of it is what makes financial sense for your hospital. Um, and then I always use ICG uh, to look at perfusion, mostly the bowel anastomosis, because I like to sleep at night. Um, so this is just my uh, port placement here. Um, oh, you can't see. Uh, oh, yeah, there it is. Um, so these are all our robot ports here, 8888. There's a 12 air seal. And then this is the um, 15 uh, port that I bring my stapler through um, when I do handheld stapler. If I do robotic stapler, I actually uh, open another uh, Da Vinci port and I port hop one in here and I kind of rotate all of the arms around. But if you have a handheld stapler, it's just lined up beautifully to come right there and do your small bowel work. Um, so now I have my video. All right, um, so I'm just going to live narrate this for you. So it's a robotic ileal conduit here. Um, so this is the harvesting of the small bowel here. And then this is actually an echelon stapler. And you can see this patient had a bunch of adhesions to start. Um, and just perpendicular straight on there and use the tip up and then uh, we'll come in and reposition our bowel. So that's gonna be one of our limbs there. And then I kind of position it in the way that I'm gonna sew it, the way that it's gonna sit uh, once we're done with the surgery, and then just kind of reorient it. I think so much of this is about setting it up. Um, I think you can measure it. This is a little bit older video. I don't measure it anymore. I kind of just pull it up to the abdominal wall for length. Um, and then uh, bring the second fire. I would say most of the time, the staple work takes less than 10 minutes, um, especially if we have somebody at the bedside who's changing the staple loads pretty quickly. Um, but most of the time, by the time the staple load's ready, um, I'm ready to go with the bowel. And you'll see that I'm not um, taking, I don't think it's necessary to take a ton of the mesentery, but I do take the mesentery with the um, staples. And so now we're just gonna do a normal side-by-side -side anastomosis. I do cut directly into the staple line. Um, this allows me to have a nice handle um, and it gives me something to hold on to when I go and put it on the stapler. So we'll just do that on both sides. And you can see they're already sitting next to each other. So if you set it up well, you're already ready to go. You don't wanna be struggling um, with your angles. And so when they come with the stapler, you're gonna see they're gonna come right in here. There it is. Um, this echelon stapler, it has like this no slip grip on the bottom. So I put that one in on the bottom and then I just slide the bowel there and then it kind of stays. Sometimes it slips off, but a lot better than on, on this side. And then we'll just slip both sides on and kind of pull them so that they sit nicely there, close, fire, and our side-by-side -side is done. And then I think, um, you know, the part that we always worry about when we're doing the bowel anastomosis is making sure that we get the back here. So I kind of flip it over, make sure that I see serosa there, serosa here, grab below it, and then I'll just hold it up high 
and come across again with that 15. It's lined up perfectly. And go all the way across. You run out of stapler quick with this. So, um, so that's just four loads of staples there. And then um, we'll get started on the conduit portion. And so this is going to be where my uh, left ureter comes in. And so that's going to lay right here. So there's not like a long segment. Oh, sorry, that's the end that's going to come out. So uh, the other segment is going to be down here. I don't remove the staples. Uh, I let them be. I don't have a, a bunch of patients that have um, stones at their staple line. So that's where the right ureter is going to go, right there. And so when it lays anatomically, the ureter kind of lays like this on it when it's pulled up. And then the left ureter is going to be kind of right here. And it's going to, it's already tunneled underneath the uh, sigmoid here. I think the question that we get asked a lot is, do you have to tunnel it? Um, the truth is, is I don't know the answer to that. I most of the part do tunnel it for the conduits. And we'll just take a look. Oh, look, it's green. No leaks. Yay. Um, and then spatulate this. And the spatulation, usually I do two and a half um, or two cuts. And you see, like, I think the key to preventing strictures is not leaving a really long segment of ureter, making sure that everything that I do leave has good blood supply. Um, but also you can see, like, really trying to preserve and not thin the ureter a lot. So there's a lot of fat around that. And so all of this stuff here, all of that's going to go. So this is, this is where I want it to be. I don't want like a giant segment of ureter that is devascularized across the um, abdomen. And so especially this guy, we'll change out to our needle drivers. And so this is a 4 vicral. This is just a lining up stitch. So just bringing these two together. Um, and the way that I set this up is very, um, so that everything is a forehand stitch so that anybody can do it. All my residents can tell you everything's a forehand stitch. Um, so that way every stitch is a good stitch. So you're getting good ureter, good bowel. And so we'll tie this here. And so the ureter stitches, I used to use two 4 monocurls on PS2s tied together. Um, and that's what you see here. Recently I've strict switched to uh, 4 0 stratifixes. Um, depending on who's in the room with me, some of my uh, scrubs that are travelers, stuff like that, don't necessarily know how to tie knots very well. Um, so that just takes any of the guesswork about tying knots out of it. So I've uh, recently come to like that suture. So we'll put this on tension. And um, so they went outside on the bowel, outside in. And so then this is inside out at the apex here. And I do still leave ureteral stents. I think there are some urologic oncologists out there that are not leaving uh, ureteral stents anymore and have seen a decrease in pyelonephritis associated with that. Um, I take care of a lot of patients that are rural, and if uh, I did not leave stents, they would not necessarily come back to my office and let me check on them and head off any problems that I might be able to see at that kind of two-week mark when sometimes they don't look so great. So I'm just going to kind of cinch this down here, and you'll see the stent. This is a bander stent. It doesn't have a hole at the end, so the wire's just through it, and we'll just put that through. Um, I know there's a lot of different stents out there. It's just the one that we have. And then I'm going to snake my fourth arm through, and sometimes that's the hardest part of the case. Um, the right side is usually easier because it's straightened out from the left ureteral stent. And so I'm just going to put that there. They're going to hand me the end of the stent. And I usually just leave my stents for two weeks, um, unless they're post-radiation. Then I leave them for about a month afterwards. And so just kind of pull it until it flattens out. And then we're going to take the needle, and we're going to run it um, on the side that's closest to us. And we'll go ureter to bowel and kind of put the ureter on stretch a little bit there. Um, depending on the angles of the patient, how much cheaper you're in, how much bowels come in in your face, uh, sometimes the place to grab is actually kind of right here on the conduit. It just really depends on the angles. So here we'll take uh, ureter, get a good bite of ureter there, and then take it back to the apex. And so this is, on this side I do ureter to bowel, and then on the other side I'll do bowel to ureter. So they end up across from each other, so we try a car from across when we get to that side.
Um, and you can see the, the cutting needle, I really love for this. It's very atraumatic to the ureter, and you can see you just kind of push the tissue around um, and try not to um, try not to cause any extra damage. And use that um, suture to kind of line yourself up for the next one, and then we'll run the other side and just run that up. Yeah, and I don't think anything's perfect. I think you know people still have ureteral strictures, but for the most part, um, patients seem to do pretty well. And then that's the ureter, so we always send our final margins. I don't send any frozens. Kind of try to catch you guys up here since we're a little behind. And then I just, I make this uh, little ureteral blanket. So all that periureteral tissue, um, I'll put three stitches, one here, here, and here to kind of just cover the anastomosis and make it look really pretty. I do think that it helps, um, you know, just kind of keep the blood supply all in the correct direction, keep everything watertight. And then that's the start of that one. And so this is the end of the case. So I, um, I don't stick two fingers in, even though I have uh, size, size six fingers. I do think peristomal hernias are a huge problem. Um, so really try to do everything I can prevent it. So I'll put one finger in, and then this is a Babcock alongside of it, and then just pull it up, and you can see even with that small amount of stapling of the mesentery, things just slide right up. That's it.